Hello, and good afternoon, and welcome to the Take a Leap Foundation's Careers Unlocked live show production panel. On behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Artless Pool Jr. and the foundation, the panelists as well, I say thank you for joining us. I am Carol Riddick, your moderator for today's event and the foundation's 2020 co-chair. The Take a Leap Foundation is an organization created to empower youth and provide access to educational and professional resources. As such, the decision was made to open the conversation about live show production. I mean, given that we're all in the midst of transitioning into what will become our new normal. It is our hope that you take away from today's event the knowledge, hope, and assurance that you need to move forward with the understanding that we're all in this together. With that being said, I'd like to introduce you to today's phenomenal panelists. When I make the introduction, I'll tell you their name and their title, and they will give a brief explanation of their skill set. I'd like to begin first with the introduction of Mr. Dominic Keska, whose title is tour manager slash production manager. Hey, Dom. Hi, Carol. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to Take the Lead Foundation for inviting me and having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here uh, with my friends and colleagues and family. Um, I'm a, a tour manager, a production manager, and an event producer. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Miss Danielle M. Lewis, and thank you, Don. <laughs> She's a production manager slash audio engineer. Hey, Danielle. Hey, Carol. Hey, Don. Um, I am the production manager at the Keswick Theater, and um, the start of my career, I was an audio engineer. So most of the time, I serve as a monitor engineer, but I do front of house as well. Followed by Mr. Dietrich Lohman. Thank you, Danielle. He's a stage manager and drum tech. Hey, Dietrich. What's happening, Carol? How are you? What's <laughs> going on, everybody? I am, I've been a stage manager. I am a stage manager. Uh, I currently serve as senior music coordinator of Late Night with Seth Meyers uh, on NBC as well. Uh, but, you know, both a bunch of things, but stage managing and drum tech is something that uh, I started doing and continue to do as well. Thank you, Dietrich. Uh, next, we have Mr. Robert Bloom. Rob is a production and lighting designer. Hey, Rob. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Thank you for Take Leap Foundation. Uh, I am a production designer and lighting designer working in all. We seem to be having some technical diff difficulties in Rob's transmission. Uh, and architectural projects as well. Okay. okay. I'll, thank you, Rob, very much. Uh, and thank you all for your patience and understanding. Next up, we have Mr. Artless Poole Jr., front of house engineer. Hey, everybody. How you doing today? How's everything going? Thank you, Carol. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Would you like to give us a brief description of what your uh, your, your skill set entails? Oh, yeah, sure. I am the front of house engineer. Uh, what I do basically do is I mix the sound for the audience. I make sure they hear everything that they see on stage and <clears throat> and uh, make sure that uh, all of the uh, uh, make sure all of the techs and all of the all of the engineers have what they need audio wise and 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 just have a good and all around have a good time at the show. I know that's right. And lastly but not least, we have Mr. Paul Clemson who is a monitor engineer. Paul, would you mind saying hello? Good afternoon, Carol. Thanks for coming. Hello, Zoomland. Um, I work in part uh, with Artless uh, as a modern engineer. I handle what the band hears. Make sure that each one of them can get their job appropriately on stage. Um, I've worked with Artless and Dietrich and Robert on these shows uh, the last while. <laughs> Artless and I worked together for a while at uh, NBC. Well, thank you so much. And Dom is our caretaker. I'm so sorry. <laughs> he takes care of us. 
he, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Thank you, Paul. And terribly sorry, sorry for the uh, introduction. Thank you for joining us today once again. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, although we will discuss many aspects of production, and I'd like to, to uh, make it clear to you all that we did receive your questions and we will do our very best to answer all of them um, in the midst of discussion. But I'd like to begin with just how the jobs of the individual panelists impact a show. And uh, Don, you would be so kind. Would you please provide an in-depth overview um, of where the show actually, uh, where creating a show actually begins? But would you do so leading into the different careers with the individual panelists, if that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank thanks so much. Um, okay, so creating a show. Uh, it, it all starts with uh, the genesis of an idea. And the idea um, can stem from uh, an artist, uh, a band, um, an organization, a, a brand or a corporation, um, and they want to um, display their talents, do something impactful. Um, maybe it's for the community, maybe it's to, um, you know, uh, uh, show off uh, a new record that they just put out if you're a band. Uh, so you, you want to create a show. Um, in creating a show, uh, for me, there are three buckets to keep in mind when you're creating a show. Um, the creative, uh, what's the show going to look like, uh, sound like, uh, what are you trying to uh, portray what idea are you trying to put forth uh, to everybody that's uh, going to see your show? Uh, the technical aspect, um, which uh, really requires a lot of uh, collaboration and communication uh, to execute your vision and your show. And uh, fortunately, here today, we have uh, folks from various disciplines uh, that can get into their technical roles and how uh, we all collaborate, work together to make the show happen. And then lastly, uh, the financial element. Um, what can you afford? Uh, you know, what, what, what's feasible? Um, you know, all these things really uh, create this Venn diagram of um, what kind of show you can, you can uh, achieve and put on. Um, you know, you can uh, obviously dream up what you want to dream up, but there are, are uh, very strict realities when it comes to finances, uh, technical aspects, uh, technology, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think uh, really where we should start is uh, there are three phases of, of a show. Pre-production, uh, where all the planning um, uh, goes into to the show that you want to execute. Uh, the production of the show, um, when the show is actually taken, uh, you know, to that live audience, let's just say, and then the 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 fun part uh, uh, is the is the wrapping and and all the you know tying up the loose ends and and finalizing the budgets. Um, uh, it's not that much fun, but we got to do it. Um, so uh, I think we can talk about. Um, uh, and get into the, the creative element and the, the creative aspect of uh, maybe working with, uh, let's say, an artist or a brand. And uh, I could kick it to our friend Robert here, uh, who's a lighting designer, show designer. Uh, Robert, how do you, um, let, let's say an artist or a brand approaches you, uh, where does it start with, with uh, making their vision yeah. reality? Uh, hello, everyone. Hopefully the internet holds this time on my end here. Um, so it starts the conversation, you know, uh, I'll ask the band, you know, if it's music, you know, if we're, if the tour is a new album, you know, what's the inspiration on the album? Why'd you write this music? What does music mean to you? Uh, and visually, how do you see yourself on stage? Uh, what is it? Uh, what's the story you want to tell? You know, at the end of the day, we're, we're storytellers and, um, you know, I just, it, it's a, hopefully an open-ended conversation uh, about how it is they see themselves on stage. And then we start putting the pieces together of, you know, okay, well, what, is, what does that mean? Is it bright? Is it dark? Uh, is it big? Is it small? Uh, all, all the different 
different uh, parameters that play into it. Uh, and then we start bringing uh, different departments in uh, to help execute that vision um, from, you know, lighting and scenic uh, to then audio and video. And um, video has become a, a much larger component of things as of late, although um, I still like a traditional show that, that has no video elements. Uh, but again, it all really depends on what the, um, uh, what the artist is looking for. Cool, thank you. And, and um, you know, we, we figure out what that vision looks like, um, what, uh, what they wanna obviously portray um, to, to the fans or whoever's in attendance. And then um, uh, Artless, Dietrich, our friend Paul, um, Danielle, uh, it's, it's then, it's then uh, our jobs uh, and their jobs to, uh, to make sure that uh, everything on the technical side, uh, audio, the audience can hear, the, uh, they can hear themselves on stage, um, uh, they have the equipment they need, uh, and, and at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, uh, again, it all comes back to collaboration and communication and, uh, my, me as a production manager, myself as a production manager, um, I'm, I'm working with everybody here, uh, to make sure that we have all the tools we need to succeed. Um, so, um, Dom, if I might like, interrupt you for one moment, I'm so yeah, sorry, but when you guys are talking about, and I want to make sure I address this because it was a question that was asked, um, when you're talking about creating the show and starting, when it begins, someone asked about advancing the show. So before you, you start putting the show together, what, um, can you speak toward advancing the show? You as well, Danielle, can you guys talk about, um, advancing the show and, and explain what exactly that means? Yeah, totally. So um, an advance is um, uh, myself as a tour manager, production manager, I'm gathering information about, um, let's, let's use a band as an example. Um, you know, I'm gathering all the information about uh, the band's preferences, who they are, what they like, um, how many people are in the band, what instruments they play, what do they need equipment wise. Um, you know, we're going into talking about um, how we how are we traveling to the show, and I um, I take all these elements and aggregate all this information and uh, build out things like um, uh, a rider, for example. And um, a rider is um, an explanation of the th things that you're looking for and you need uh, for your band. Uh, let's just say to to be successful uh, when walking into um, a venue to do a show. So this this conversation uh, starts with reaching out to Danielle, for example, uh, a production manager at a venue, and saying, "Hey, Danielle, um, you know I'm the tour manager, production manager for this band. Uh, we're coming to your venue." Um, here are the things that that we have uh giving her all the information um you know uh how we're traveling and what technical things we need and then that conversation begins um so danielle uh what what what, what happens from that first email or that first phone call um hi everybody lots of things happen after that first initial contact um from my perspective, I view my role as the concierge of the venue. So pretty much I have to get information from you um, about what you require, know the capability of the venue, if there's any limitations, because I know the house, so to speak. Um, so once I look at that, you and I, Dom, go back and forth and say, well, okay, do you really need this or what else can I get for you? So it's my job to make sure that you as the tour have everything that you need to get the job done and to have a great time at my house or my venue. Mm -hmm. I also am responsible for the technicians who would be in-house. So in this case, it would be all the gentlemen, the, on the, the technicians on the rest of the call. So if there's something we need to cross rent and cross renting is if it's something that's missing from what we may have in house, we may need to call a sound company to rent an additional piece of equipment if you're not carrying that on the tour. 
So there's a lot of dialogue back and forth between Dom and myself, even before, I mean, this could be a couple months, it could be, you know, a couple of weeks. There's a lot of back and forth to make sure, hey, this is what we need. As well as not only production, I need to pass you off to the proper people regarding hospitality, regarding merch, to make sure your day goes as smoothly as it possibly can while you're at the venue. <clears throat> so it's a lot of dialogue, you know, Email is great, but I personally rather talk to somebody live, which sometimes is challenging because if you're out on tour, you're busy dealing with that day. So, you know, it's a lot of juggling. You got to be really organized. You have True. to really have um, have a sense of, okay, you got to be able to prioritize a lot. Danielle, if I might inter interject for one moment, uh -huh. um, and, I, and this is for the both of you because Dom made a reference to a writer. And, mm -hmm. and, and I hear you speaking about the things that, you know, when everyone comes into your into your house, making them comfortable, making mm -hmm. artists comfortable. If you wouldn't mind just explaining, because I'd like for them to make the connection. I'd like the connection sure. to, to be made between what, how you know what everyone needs sure. and what a writer is. Sure. Um, on my side of it, once, once the concert is a go from the talent buyer purchasing the tour or, you know, it's a go to Dom and his people are coming to the venue, then I look at the contract and I extract what I need. From that is the writer. The writer is specifics about whatever production equipment that they need regarding audio, video, and lighting. It also includes hospitality because we have to feed you for the day. Beverages, food, snacks. You know, some people require, I need a, a, a vase of flowers in my dressing room when I'm there. So anything that the artist needs or the tour needs to make them comfortable, it's not not just about the artist, because the specifics about the crew, the bus driver, that sort of thing. The bus driver may have driven all night and they need a hotel room, so they need to stay somewhere. So all of these accommodations, um, the writer specifies what the tour is in need of and what they require. Sometimes venues can accommodate, but that's when the negotiation back and forth between Dom and myself would say, hey, what can we do? How can we make this work? But majority of the time, the venue will do what they absolutely possibly can while watching the budget, what they can possibly do to fulfill the writer and give the artist what they need. Big question for you, is there, are there two different writers or is there just one? Is there a, techni uh, a technical writer and a hospitality writer or is it all just in It one depends on how the document. artist the tour sets it up. Okay. I've seen it both ways. Um, typically it's all in the contract. So it can be segmented per department, be it hospitality, production, that sort of thing. But typically it's in the contract or attached as an addendum. Okay. And it has everything you need. And if there's something missing, I don't have a problem calling. Hey, Dom, I noticed you guys didn't have this or you didn't have that. Will you need this? You kind of rely on if you see something missing or if it's something you traditionally see or offer or can offer, then that's something that you reach out and you say, hey, would you guys like this? Or is this going to be there? Because, you know, everybody's human. People forget. But typically right. everything is in the contract and it's up the, to the venue production manager to extract the information and then dialogue with Dom to make sure things are, you know, what they need when they arrive. Okay. And then what's next? What follows after all of the... Um... Once everything is solidified on my end, I then begin to work with the technicians, be it, you know, art, Liz, Dietrich, and uh, Paul, and Rob, mm -hmm. I then take the information, organize in a certain way, depending on how, person, this is my personal pr procedure, however you like to receive the information is the way I'm going to disseminate. I'm a customer um, service person by nature. I just, you know, that's what I do. Yes. So um, I'm going to go the extra mile to make sure everybody is comfortable um, getting what they need. So that's when I take the technical information, I disseminate that to the technicians. I then take the information, give it to catering. I give the finance, more than likely the GM or whoever's going to settle if it's not me. They're, they're going to have the information regarding the financials. You kind of need to know from the time, from the top of the day to the end of the day, what the picture looks like and plan it out. You got I got to create day sheets. So what a day sheet is, Dom is going to be on the tour and have his own day sheets. But then once you get to the venue, and this is something Dom and I would have discussed, what's the schedule for the day? What time okay. is the bus coming? What do you guys need when you get off, meaning breakfast, lunch, or whatever? Then what time are we doing sound check? How long is sound check? 
What time is going, the stage going to go dark? What time the doors? Like that's a snapshot of the day. That's so something that Dom and I work out. So it's the production manager's responsibility to create the day sheet and to make with sure- With the tour manager, yes. With the, with the tour manager, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Thank um, you. I have a question um, piggybacking off of what you were just saying, Danielle, Artlist, um, Paul and Rob, would you all speak toward what, um, how your jobs intersect and what happens next? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like once we get the information from our production manager, uh, I know my first question is usually, well, what, do, what does the venue have as far as technical specs? Like what are their audio specs? Um, and I know we always can't trust you know, uh, writers and, and things. So I like to talk to the actual head engineer of the venue to, to sort of so, to sort of know what uh, not only everything that he has, but what's actually working. So in that case, I say, OK, so you have this. I see this on your I see this on your tech spec. What do you have? Everything that you have is everything working. Um, and if there's some things that uh, I prefer to use, uh, i.e. consoles, for instance, um, I'll say, okay, I see you have this console, but I like to use, I, I need to use this console in order to keep the, the continuity of, of our show going. So can you guys rent me this console? Um, and sometimes it depends on the, you know, the budget uh, of the artists uh, and, and, and the production managers work out who pays for what, but um, as far uh, as far as technical standpoints, uh, I I have to make sure the modern engineer has everything he needs for our show. Make sure that I have everything I need for our show. Make sure our lighting director has everything he needs for our show, um, meaning the band's show. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I can go to Rob or, or Paul like with uh, technical specs to see, you know, how you guys like to deal with talking to your perspective uh, spec uh, text as well in the venue. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll kick it off here. Uh, my communication is obviously very important talking to local text, but it, it starts the paperwork, you know, one level before that. So after I've had that conversation with the band, okay, so this is what it's going to look like. This is what we want it to feel like. Uh, that boils down to literally nuts and bolts on a, on a piece of paper. And so uh, you know, in a, in a show that it will say a medium to small bus and truck where we're bringing lighting equipment with us and we're bringing staging equipment with us, uh, perhaps along the back line and whatever else, um, I'm going to specify on paper uh, precisely what it is we're using, where it belongs, uh, you know, drafted to scale uh, on, a, on a light plot and a ground plan. Uh, and that is um, uh, what I'd say as a document uh, crosses all languages. Right, so it literally lines on a page, and if you don't speak English, and I gave you this piece of paper, you'd have a good idea of what it is we're trying to execute when we show up. And when you open, when we open up our trucks, these cases are going to roll out, and uh, and this is where it literally by forty foot page, the dryer is right here, and there's the lights right there, uh, and you can expand that by by multiple trucks, uh, and so. Uh, once that paperwork is in a good place, uh, that's the conversation. I, I, I talk to a local uh, lighting crew chief or uh, master electrician, and oh, I'm getting unstable. Hopefully, we're still good here. And um, and then we say, hey, look, this is what I'm planning on doing. Does this work in your venue? Do you have enough power to to execute what I need? Is the footprint right? Uh, and the design is usually scalable so that in smaller venues, some things might stay on the truck, uh, or we somehow work with the local venue to make sure that we have. I mean, usually it's it's power and space from a visual perspective that I'm concerned with. Does everything fit in the room? Is it safe? Uh, and and then we'll look how we want it to look. So much sense to me, but it never once occurred to me that you would have to to speak with someone to ask if the actual venue can accommodate. <laughs> Which, so to be fair, the the venue does send paperwork our way. It's it's a two way communication, Danielle. I'm sure you know, like we get specs of the venue and which will tell us not only how much power is available, but exactly where the power is located on stage, okay. uh, so that we run the proper cables uh, to make sure you know. The, the, so think of uh, in the lighting system and and I you know, uh, different departments are similar, but it's sort of a hub and spoke system, right? And so we build this hub that we call Dimmer Beach or Dimmer World, uh, and that is where all the, the, break, the breakers for the lights are. Uh, and so we take the power mains from the building, it goes into Dimmer Beach, and from there it spiders out into the rig. Some lines go into the air, some lines go to the deck, 
anywhere the equipment is. Uh, and there's a separate hub and spoke system for data uh, from consoles and whatnot. And so it's a question of where, do, where does that base live? Where, where's dimmer world, which is a different location than audio world, right? That, you know, audio has to set up their racks, uh, uh, which I'll let the audio department speak to. Uh, but, you know, for lighting, we need to know where are we going to be? Do we fit? Okay, I need eight feet by eight feet for dimmer beach. And then the venues go, okay, great. We have that space and we'll do it upstage right. And that's where you'll live. It's right near the, the company switch. Uh, and that's what we'll plug into, um, you know, and then uh, I don't know, Paul, take it, take it from there. Thanks, Rob. Um, similarly to what the pattern you've seen here where um, one of us communicates with the venue, sometimes a front house engineer, sometimes a monitor engineer, depending on you know the makeup of the camp that we work for. Um, but the same thing happens where Artless will issue a packet either, you know, if it's a, if it's a long run, then, you know, we'll talk about it for weeks ahead of time. If it's, you know, we're doing three shows and coming back to home base where that is for everybody, then, you know, it'll be a, a slew of emails. Um, and really he just kind of gives me the lowdown of what he discovered in the discovery phase. Um, and then I look and see if that fits into the show that I have to do on stage. And uh, as Rob just uh, referenced, usually lighting is stage right, which is if you're looking at the audience, it's the right hand side of the stage. Uh, Artless would call that house left because he is standing in the house and looking at the stage that direction. Um, Google it if you need a visual. <laughs> <laughs> knowing those terms are very important. Uh, it goes back to old, oh, years old so stage right? Um but from there, uh, audio usually sets up stage left. Um, sometimes there's a guitar tech, which um, Dietrich can, can take up here in a second and explain those inner workings. But between uh, Dietrich, the stage manager, and myself, uh, and usually the, the, the audio tech, monitor tech that's assigned to me from the house or the sound company that the, that the house is employed to fill in the extra pieces, um, we'll negotiate uh, uh, our, our footprint. We'll figure out where the racks got to go for sight lines or, you know, some venues need a uh, fire lane through monitor world <laughs> or where guests yeah. come and go. You know, it's, it's just, we're, we're, we're working in sometimes old venues that weren't necessarily made for, you know, these, these high level production shows. So, you know, after we kind of all uh, kick the sand in the morning when we first arrive with those from the venue who know, how the flow usually goes with where stuff goes. Then um, I'll work with uh, stage text, backline text, and um, the audio text to start assembling this kind of world of stuff that all goes together, both audio-wise and uh, and gear-wise. Um, usually, because a modern engineer is just by proximity closest to the stage, um, I'll have also have to deal with an RF technician. Um, usually a patch tech, uh, that person would be in charge of the input list as we issued it to the building. Um, we'll go over it in the morning. Sometimes things change in the middle of a run and now we're having extra kazoo mic or, you know, this keyboard used to be stage left, now it's stage right. Um, Sorry, Paul, would you tell us what an RF technician is? Sorry, yeah. So, um, on the RF and it's radio frequencies and uh, nowadays we use uh, frequency diverse transmitters. So if a band is using wireless microphones or wireless in-ears, um, what we wear in our ears for monitoring, each band wears um, a receiver pack that receives mm -hmm. a small powered um, radio frequency from a transmitter uh, device that sits in monitor world. And it can be upwards from, you know, if there's four people on stage, you'd have uh, 10 to 12 little radio stations going. Um, the person who kind of wrangles uh, the frequencies, you know, because there's TV stations in the area. Uh, white space is what we operate in uh, on these low level radio stations is getting smaller as the government sells off uh -huh. frequencies to um, uh, tele telephone companies. So uh -huh. it's becoming on large tours um, that I've been on, we've had upwards of 80 frequencies and oh, wow. a place like Houston, which doesn't have a lot of space, it's kind of an art form to get uh, all those little radio stations that we need to do our job. You know, you don't want the lead singer to simply not have any sound because his little radio station quit working uh, for whatever reason, could be you know, something. Um, 
And is that specific? Is that uh, specifically with regard to in ears? Did you say that, or is that just across the board with in -ears regard to monitors as well? Phones. Yeah. And then uh, there's some communication devices. Stage managers can wear a wireless headset belt pack that they can talk uh, to other stage managers, to a director if it's a big enough show where there's someone calling. Um, usually that's kind of a, a rob corner of the world that, that, that there is someone calling the show like, okay, here they come to stage, everybody ready, and we all hear it. Um, those who need to hear it, hear it. Um, so there's a few flavors of, of wireless that floats around in a, in a production. Okay. Um, but from there, uh, the patch person gets microphones on instruments, cables plugged into those microphones, and then that comes back to a main uh, kind of matrix point, a rack that gets you know all those signals plugged into so that Artless and I can then have control of, of every instrument stage to send it where we need to. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank that was a lot of information. Appreciate <laughs> it very much. Appreciate it, Dietrich. Would you mind describing and telling us um, just how you pick up from there, or your how your job intersects with everything that has taken place? Uh, in my in my opinion, as far as the stage manager is concerned, uh, in my opinion, we're supposed to be we're supposed to be our position is to be more or less like the thumb to a fist of a whole of of a movement that's about to happen. We literally have to know everything that's moving pretty much in your venue and on your tour. Like in your communication has to be very clear between your artists, you're, you're, you're even more involved than a lot of people might end up being uh, on your tour just because you're so, might have to be so direct with our artists where there's small moments where you being the stage manager makes a difference in that moment happen and show. So for that, I have to talk to Dom, who is my production manager, who's gonna give me, you know, I'm in, I'm in that meeting, not even talk to Dom. I'm really in that meeting where the production manager, tour manager, uh, you know, your music director, your lighting people, and how they see this idea now once it's been given. I'm the guy in the middle that's making and helping this all kind of play out every day. A venue might change where the space is now smaller. I got to figure out what to do with this now. 50 extra cases that would fit fine into the venue before that. It's my job to figure out where that all goes. Mm -hmm. It's my job to, to, to make sure that that goes smooth and there's just direction and people not losing their mind. Even when there may be total chaos going on, your position is to go, supposed to be to keep all of that in some kind of order. So again, from the smallest thing, from cases being uh, placed into a situation, Rob having a light that might be in a way, it was in, it was great last night, but tonight now it's just say it's somewhere where it can't be, okay? I have to figure that out to get that position without us throwing off the show and losing anything and keeping, again, keeping everybody calm in the midst of that. So you really are, like I said to me, I think it's more like a thumb thing to a fist that's making an action, you know what I mean, towards the show every night. So. I'm sorry. I was about to say no, you no. definitely do play an integral part. You you just <laughs> important. That thumb is very important. I must say. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's just my opinion, and everybody can chime in on that. But just to me, as stage manager, you really are that middle person between literally everybody when the show is moving and before getting there, mm -hmm. because your trucks are getting loaded before uh, you know every night and making sure sometimes it has to be loaded different. So you have to talk to your production manager and figure out how we're going to do this. But majority majority of times, it's a plan that you're supposed to have in action. You know. And and everybody is looking for you to kind of already have a certain plan in action and work with your, you know, your higher ups, your your venue people, and and get that and keep that relationship very smooth, uh, and keeping even your band happy. And and, and a productive stage manager is he's he's really like that guy when it comes to like band and art stuff like that. You keep a lot of things from going really left. You know what I mean? And, and, it, and it falls on you. It might not necessarily be what you might think in your job title, but the job that you end up doing, you fall, your title really kind of goes out the window. You're, you're, you're everywhere. You're, you could be doing anything again from I've taken off shoes to, to, you know, <laughs> water or whatever the case may be like, you know, that's just what it is. You know what I mean? And that's my job to see that through. Um, and I'm the la I, I could be the first guy in and the last guy out, but at the end of the day, that's what my job is. I have to see through that show from morning to end. I have people to respond back to. I have to be, make sure that me and the Danielle, that our relationship is great, that when we leave here, it's like, hey, listen, <laughs> I know we started off a little rough, but you know, <laughs> you know, you know we, we, we rebounded and we're going to get through this. So I can go back and, and I have to hear from a dominator, like, you know, hey man, you know, what was going on? And having to hear from a Rob or whoever my production manager may be, you know, yeah. asking those same questions like, yo, what, what, what happened today? How come, how come the curtain didn't fall in the way it was supposed to? How come we were dragging, you know, three minutes behind? These are things that fall on your stage manager. So yeah, and I, I think the big, the big thing is, is consistency. 
right? Like the idea is that we advance a show because we want to do the same show every night. It's the show that we planned, the show that we've rehearsed, the show that we've worked on, and, and the show that our audience is expecting and our artists are expecting to deliver. And so the, the advance, and, and it's all about how, like, how do we make the same thing happen in a new space tomorrow night that we may have never been to? And so that's what we talk to Dale, like, hey, we don't know your space, but this is what we want to do you know, tell us now if this isn't going to work because we'll figure it out together. Um, but it's it's really about that that consistency. Yeah, right. absolutely. Sense. That, that and sense. and commu and communication. Um, like I I think Dietrich is the mo one of the most integral parts of a show because he is on the stage. He sometimes he has to be my eyes because I'm so far back. I can't see what's going on. So for me, for instance, as a front house engineer, if I'm listening to a kick mic, so to speak, and it's not sounding right. I'm going to call Dietrich and be like, hey, can you just put eyes on that mic to make sure it's where it's supposed to be? Um, or Rob is like, hey, uh, can you stand here at a position to so I can focus? Or or just, he just had, uh, Dietrich just has to be, uh, just has to know everybody, know where everything is supposed to go and, and sort of orchestrate that on a day-to-day -day basis. So he's very important, very integral. Uh, and it's, a, it's most important that we all communicate with our stage manager and have a great relationship and know him and let him know what we need. And we, he can let us know, okay, we can do that or no, we can't do that. So I think that's a really good, that's a really integral part of, of, of uh, Dietrich's uh, role as well in doing the show. I want to put that in my pocket, that thumb to that hand, because I really like that. But that's so true. It is so true. Uh, um, and, and I would like to make it clear again, though, that we're all talking about um, everyone's individual skill set with regard to the way the industry was operating pre COVID. But we all have the understanding that we are in transition and, you know, into our new normal. So we will open the discussion up later, too. I just wanted to be clear, you know, that while we're all making it clear to you right now what, the, you know, what everybody does, uh, we wanted to make it clear that you know that that was how everything operated prior to and that uh, we will, we are certainly open to talking about <laughs> what is to come and you know how we how we think we're, we're going to move forward in doing so. Um, but with that said, I would like to go back. Um, Dom, I have a question for you. So where, where does an artist or a promoter acquire funding to put on a live show? So we have, we know, we know that you, you know, you get, you get this information. Um, wh where does it all begin? Where does that part, where does that, how does that part? Uh, so um, using the example of, uh, let's say a band, um, back to a band from, from, uh, the touring uh, production side, uh, a record label uh, is is one of the avenues. Um, if the band is signed to a um, small independent label or a large major label, um, there are things like uh, tour support. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, record labels uh, they provide a lot of things: uh, marketing, promotion, and and money. They're they're you know acting as a bank in, in many ways as well. Um, but this money that they're putting forth to help your tour happen, they, they want uh, to see that be recouped. So that money is going to come back to them um, after the tour is over uh, in one way or another. So, uh, you know, whether that's um, paying them back after the tour is over uh, through royalties, uh, through your deal, through your contract. Uh, so labels are one way. Um, uh, in investment, uh, if you're a, a small, uh, small artist, let's just say, um, you can, uh, you can invest into your project yourself, uh, friends, family, um, you can start a small label, um, uh, mm -hmm. with things like loans, uh, from private investors, uh, or again, like through your network, um, Okay. Uh, brands nowadays um, uh, pay a lot of bills for a lot of artists uh, or through corporate work. So true. Um, so that's also uh, another way that that you can get financing for your tour. Um, and then uh, Danielle, you could probably speak a little bit better to the the promoter side. Um, I mean, uh, promoters uh, they're they're taking a risk on you. Essentially, you know, they're they're the ones that um, are 
putting up money um, and guaranteeing you X amount of dollars, uh, depending on whatever the deal is. And they're hoping that uh, enough people come through their venue uh, to, again, recoup and to make a profit. That's so true. Um, so, Danielle, you've obviously, in front, some, from the promoter side, I mean, it's, it's probably the same situation, right? Where um, they, uh, they have investment or they're a large, uh, uh, obviously, a giant of a company like an AEG or Live Nation. Um, or uh, a small independent promoter that, again, is they're putting up their own money to, mm -hmm. to put a show on. Right. I've seen um, outside of my current position working with a larger company, the Keswick is owned by a K, uh, AEG. But when I was freelancing, you know, promoters, you know, hook or crook, most of the time I didn't ask for sometimes didn't want to know where they got the money from. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's just my job to be like, oh, okay, we're going to do a show. We're going to do a show. But it comes from various entities. I mean, people, if people have a, I don't want to make it as lofty as a dream, but if you have a mission or it's like, look, we're going to do this show. I want to do a festival this next summer. Then you spend your time figuring out how you're going to fund that and pulling the show together. So with mm -hmm. a larger company like Live Nation AEG, we have talent buyers. So, you know, they scope out who's hot, looking at the tours, who's up and coming. So they work with the people who are putting together shows and they buy the show. So that's how that works from a larger company. And it can work various ways, just like Dom said, between friends, investors, loans, um, if it's an independent situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know what? I'm I'm going to jump all over the place here because I'm I'm listening to what you guys are saying and I'm I'm working off of that um, because I too am interested in a lot of things that you guys are telling me. So, um, but if you don't mind, if if everybody would just share um, just a really quick story on how you learned your job. Like, did you receive any formal training or anything like that? And if you could just do it briefly, that would be that would be great, Dom. If you wouldn't mind kicking that off, and then Danielle. Yeah, sure. Um, for me, uh, I'm a fan of music, and I I'm a musician. Um, I, I started uh, playing drums when I was ten years old, and um, I uh, instead of um, pursuing. Um, life on stage, I, I, I realized that I was better at more of the behind the scenes uh, than I was, you know, uh, uh, on stage, let's just say. Uh, so for me, just being a fan of music early on, um, going to shows, going to live shows, just being um, really uh, taken back and, and, and so excited about live music and just wanting to know how, how you know, how this all happened. Um, I, I was able to uh, meet some folks um, when I was uh, younger in high school, um, networked. I would, I would go to shows and try to talk to people, whether it was uh, people that worked at the venue or technicians that were on a tour or musicians that were part of the show. And through that, um, that gave me my opportunities to, to start. And, and I, um, I, I've done the... Uh, I've done the whole gamut where, you know, I, I've been around a country, the country in a, in a van, driven a van, driven an RV. I've, I've done the small band tours. That's the fun uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's fun stuff. <laughs> to fill buses, uh, to, to flying to, to cities around the world for, for just one show. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you, know, you know, I started it by just asking questions. Uh, thankfully, I had uh, individuals that, uh, gave me some opportunities and and mentored me along the way. I think uh, I think our friend Marciano Agavon's on here somewhere. He was Marciano. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, I you know I I at the very very beginning, I pushed cases, I uh, teched, I sold merchandise, I assisted, and. Uh, that's essentially what helped me uh, uh, just learn, pay attention, uh, learn from people that have done it before me, and 
essentially become a tour manager, a production manager, um, and and just working my way through the uh, through the ranks. Let's just say. Okay. Okay. Danielle, would you mind sharing with us? Uh, sure. I was not formally trained. This is actually my second career. I was at Verizon for 12 years as a system analyst. Um, so I didn't start off doing this at all. Um, <laughs> but my love for music is what, is what drove me here. Um, I used to sing allergies, asthma, messed that up. Um, so there was, I had to ask myself, what way could I be connected still to music? Um, and I was like, hmm, I like math and science. I understand physics. Let me see what this sound thing is all about. And literally, I got the Yamaha Sound Reinforcement book, and I read it from cover to cover. I asked people questions. I went and volunteered for small sound companies while working at Verizon at night and on the weekends. And then there was an opportunity at my church. At the time, it was a smaller church, but they moved and built a 3,000-seat venue. So because I had been dabbling in the sound thing, that sort of thing, once we got to the new building, most of the people on the audio ministry, male or female, they were scared to operate the larger platform console. It was the 56 Mac. It was analog. It was back in the day. <laughs> um, wow. And literally we were in a meeting. I remember distinctively. And the head of the ministry was like, you know, we need people to work this. Who's going to do it? And nobody raised their hand. And I was like, well, it's 56 channels are the same thing, so I guess I can figure it out. It will be you <laughs> prepared. It's a great way to look at it, too. Oh. <laughs> that was the way I viewed it. I was like, I had already been reading and doing small stuff, but it was like, okay, what other, I didn't have another opportunity to cut my teeth, so to speak. So church was where I pretty much started. And as I honed my skills and still did stuff at night on the weekends, I eventually retired or quit my job and started doing this full time. Get out. See, I want to go back to that too, that uh, talking yeah. about working in the houses of worship. I definitely want to touch on that. Mm -hmm. But um, Rob, would you mind giving us a, a, a little brief little? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I've, I've had a mix of both uh, on the job training and some formal training. Uh, it started at a very young age. My family, I grew up uh, very much exposed to the arts. My mom was a dance teacher uh, and she instilled uh, a strong connection to music and the arts. And so we would see Broadway, we would see um, concerts, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so, I don't know, around age 10, I think I operated my first follow spot in middle school. Uh, and in high school, I was very active with the theater program. I was a stage manager, I was an electrician, I was an audience, like, you know, we, we would do it all, right? It's, it's sort of like community theater, we, we, we would do it all. Uh, I went to NYU thinking that I would be a Broadway stage manager. Uh, by uh, my sophomore college, I realized that was not what I wanted to do in life. Uh, and I wanted to be a lighting designer. And I was a really good electrician at the time. Uh, like I, kn I knew the gear, I knew how it worked, uh, but I didn't know why we used the gear. And so college helped fill in um, a more formal design training, color theory, composition, instrumentation, storytelling, um, you know, things that are multidisciplinary, both across music, uh, and, and all sorts of uh, arts. I swung a wrench at the Joyce Theater while I was still in college uh, and got a great uh, uh, experience about how international uh, designers work different from domestic designers and, and the international uh, schools and how, how they teach color theory differently. Uh, and then uh, I graduated, I started working for uh, a production company that did like really uh, high-end events, these like million dollar weddings and bar mitzvahs and these way overdone parties. Uh, but it gave me a real opportunity to experiment and to play around uh, and ultimately to like were these dance parties, were these dance floors. Uh, and I built up a system uh, of what we call punt page uh, and how we sort of punt uh, and make lights dance to music. Uh, okay. And then a few big breaks along the way. Uh, and, uh, and here we are now. Okay. Um, yeah. So, Rob, basically, there's not one thing that you haven't done. You, you, you like you. Well, well was, yeah. No, I mean, uh, uh, certainly was, when I was younger. Yeah, yeah there was, was awesome. there, there was a choice where like I, I, electrics and lighting was the path. Also, because I didn't have the ear, so I know like like a really good audio engineer hears things that I never hear. Right. Wow. Uh, they like they can hear frequencies that you know when they're ringing out a microphone. Like, oh, that's 80 hertz or whatever. That like and I, I, I like that's not my world. Um, and uh, <laughs> but the the lighting was my world. Like that. Like visually. You know, um, I, I gravitated towards you know it, and eventually you have to start 
on you know, it, yeah but i think that's awesome that you identified that as well i mean that you started you know in one lane and then identified so that's cool um dietrich would you mind filling us in a, a little little blurb letting us know i'm gonna say blurb okay <laughs> <So>. <laughs> No, 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 no. I mean, <laughs> trust me, because we, as we already have known in these conversations, we've had personally this story can go. We can all, yeah, we can all. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can be an hour or a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, 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 the, to the most simplest of ways of putting my story of getting where I've gotten to now, uh, church beginnings, family, you know, just music and, and that just being in my upbringing. Uh, end up learning and taught myself how to play drums. Um, then from there, that went on for a while, up through high school, uh, up to about high school. And in high school, I went into a high school that had a music teacher who really cared about kids learning wow. music. He happened to be an African-American man who's not alive. His name is George Bird. Uh, it was University City High School. Um, but he, for whatever reason, him and my dad were friends and they literally drafted me from one high school to his high school because he needed a replacement drummer for Steve McKee. For all those who know Steve McKee, that is the yes. person that I was drafted for to go to the school that I went to. What? I used to go to the school when I was little, like as a kid, my dad worked at the school, so I got to sit in the band room every day and just watch Steve and um and all the other guys go in. So that's crazy. He okay. taught me, but he taught me, he literally told me I, he refused for me to be a musician, just to be a musician. He he would not allow it if he had anything to do with it. So he made me literally become the head of the music department for our high school. So I had to learn audio. I had to, I had to learn lighting. I had surely Caesar was my first professional job. She rented yeah. out our high school and I had to be the, I had to be the audio engineer for Shirley Caesar at university. What? Well, what somebody had to do it, right? Somebody, somebody had to do it. Is that what we're doing here? Somebody had to do so, it, right? So that, so that, and then just along the way, and then, you know, coming across other great people uh, as life has brought me along the way, you know, I, Drum tech was my first kind of real introduction into like the business on like a real professional level, sure. uh, if you would. And then from there, I've stage managed, production managed, and everything in between, you know, wow. get, get here. But yeah, it's, it was literally just my mom, of course, being the person behind me, but that teacher, Mr. Bird, was like, Mr. Bird, changed doing? everything. So that was my, if you want to say training, it was this man who, it would be two o'clock in the morning, I could still be at high school with him, taking apart the whole, all speakers, all kind of randomness. Wow. And that was See, that's, that's how love. We, that that's really love. I mean, I know that you guys are phenomenal, but just hearing your individual stories is even more inspiring to me. And and, and I know how phenomenal you are. Um, Paul, would you would you speak toward uh, how you learned about your job and all of that, and whether or not you had formal training? Can you share with us as well, please? Take uh, take a, a sliver from everybody so far, because that's it's the same story. I grew up playing music as a kid. Mom made me take piano lessons. And then my Mr. Bird is David Bean. My band director would sign us up for stuff we didn't even like. We'd he'd be like, "Oh, you're playing a upright bass solo at the Jazz Fest of the state that we're going to go <laughs> play at anyways as a band." And but and he just he just kept us really busy. Like you were playing in pit band and marching band and show you know, like just music, music, music all through high school. Um, out of high school, I knew I wasn't college material, so I went to a tech school in Ohio called the Recording Workshop of Ohio. Um, there was a few uh, week, uh, like a six week, uh, you know, three week. There was all these little packages of programs you could take on recording and, and some, so a little bit of live sound, some digital media back then. Um, uh, the program we used called Pro Tools was just coming out. Pro Tools. Uh, so I learned that early on. And then... Um, Moved to St. Louis and interned at a studio and the owner had a system in a club. So he'd pay me 50 bucks to mix these really good St. Louis cover bands. Wow. So that was kind of the proving grounds. And then from there, I moved to Nashville and started in, in um, a bunch of Christian acts. Uh, jumped to country, got married, wife started <laughs> a career. That added a whole nother element, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a whole nother level. Um, but the same thing is, is like... It, it, it all you know focuses around music and we you know every one of us knows what the show should look like mm -hmm. or not look like this but just you know we all kind of know besides just what my show looks like what I have to accomplish for the night um we all have that that vision of what the big picture looks like and then you just Absolutely. help out as you can 
Right. And it's just years of filling the gaps. Um, I've up until from high school until just a few years ago, I'd only read manuals. I'd never read anything like fictional or it was just steeping in in technology, you know, since starting day one. Um, okay. Okay. And then just keeping friends close, you know, taking care of people. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Artless, would you mind? Would you mind sharing with us as well? Oh, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it it started with my love of music um, from the first concert I went to, honestly, which was an Erica Badu concert. Uh, I remember wanting to be in music and wanting to go into the music industry, but not sure not sure what I wanted to do. Okay. Um, until I went to this show, um, Eric Benet was opening. This was for her first album. Wow. And um, right. uh, I remember sitting in the audience and listening to the sound, and it was just immaculate. Like, I was like, I want to do that. Whatever, whoever's doing this, I want to <laughs> do that. Uh, uh, shout out to Gordon Mack, because I found out later on that it was him. It was Gordon Mack that was mixing that <laughs> show. Um, but he uh, that that show inspired me. Uh, him mixing the way he does inspired me. Um, so from there, I started uh, going to shows in New York uh, when I came home from college, and I happenstance on this uh, on this Roots Jam session, and uh, I was like. But my, my my friend Tyrone at uh, my friend uh, Tyrone was like, yeah, you should just ask somebody what they're what they're doing. You always want to, you know, you've always wanted to work with them. So I found out who the manager was. Uh, it was Rich Nichols. Uh, I introduced oh, myself to him, wow. and I was like, oh. hey, I was like, hey, I want to I want to do this. Do you have any openings? And he was like, uh, yeah, you know, just you know, whatever, just being aloof uh, the way he was, just very you know, in the background mm -hmm. um, at first. Um, he wasn't sure if I was serious. So, you know, he gave me his number uh, and, and uh, he was like, yeah, just call me. I called him three weeks straight. He did not respond at all. You know, I, I, would, I would like to interject. I'm sorry, because I thought you were pausing a little longer. So, but I, I do have a question for you because it, it was, um, it was told to me that you sing as well. Is that true? Uh, I, I did go to, I did. Hmm. Sing is such a strong word. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, 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 well, my first year in college, I, I, I majored in music with the emphasis in voice performance. So yes, um, I, I did get some from some vocal coaching. Um, okay, I learned, I learned how to sing my first aria my first year in college. Uh, excuse me. Yep. yep. Excuse. Me. Yes. Yes. How yep. do you leave that out? I, I mean, because that that's that's not my life. That's not my lane. Remember, <laughs> we were talking about switching, deciding which way to go. But you know, that it's a contributing factor. It's a contributing factor. I, know, I, I guess I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's giving me the ear that I have, you know, for See, music. But you know, and I'll say this. I will say this to all of you. I too. I mean, I overstand how impressed you were when you went to Erica Badu's show because I too was so like I, I was. Like, oh my goodness, who is mixing? Who is her front of house engineer? Who is her LD, her, her lighting director for any of you uh, who are unfamiliar? But I, I too was wondering, oh my goodness, this is magical. So I understand, but see, it didn't affect me that way. That's not my calling. So, you, you know, <laughs> you, you know. So, it, you know, it's, 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 um, I think it's important to let everyone know from where we came and, you know, because I mean, I went to college to, to be an anchor woman. I was studying communication. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> so, I didn't know that. Yeah. And I'm here. I'm here. But I love being here. So, yeah. But I, I also want to segue into talking about some of the challenges. Thank you, first of all, to each and every one of you for your blurbs. We truly do appreciate that. But I um, would like to segue into some of the challenges that you all face personally and professionally with regard to your individual skill sets and, 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 and working a live show. How about Danielle? Miss Danielle, we'll start <laughs> ladies first. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, um, repeat the question again, Carol. So I would like to segue and ask you all to, to let us know some of the challenges that you face both personally and professionally um, with regard to live show production. That is an interesting question, and that could be a whole separate um, <laughs> webinar in and of itself. Um, it could. <laughs> There, there are quite a few challenges. Um, 
I will speak from a couple perspectives. It's challenging because not every, not every technical person is as open as the panel that we have here and willing to share information when you're starting. Um, not everybody wants to share because some people have a mentality that if I tell you what I do, I'm giving up secrets and then you're going to take my job. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to that, you know, because what's for me, God has for me. And Hello. if I can enable you to do your job, I, it's not my knowledge to begin with. Somebody gave it to me. So why could I hoard it? I mean, it's not, I didn't come out thinking, oh, I'm going to be an audio engineer and I know all this stuff. No, somebody had to teach me. Somebody had to lead me. Somebody had to help me. So therefore it is my duty to do the same thing. I, you um, know what I would that, like to ask? I'm sorry. I would like to ask when you all are explaining um, and, and answering the question that I just asked, would you also add to that? Like, how does that relate with regard to family? And, and how do you balance family and touring, you know, and, and you know, anything that you can let everybody know that, that helps you stay connected? It's, it's challenging. Um, technology definitely helps. I don't travel as much. Um, uh, because uh, four years ago, my mother fell sick, but she's fine now. Um, but I don't travel as much, but you do miss birthdays. You miss special days. It, it's hard because it's like, you know, your friends will be like, oh, we're going to celebrate this. We're going to do that. And you're like, oh, well, I got a gig. What time do you get off? You're like, uh, mm -mm. Uh, there is no, I don't know, like two o'clock. Like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't get off. Basically, I don't get off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a day. It's, it's literally a day thing. But the average person doesn't think about that because they, if you're a concert goer, you're not thinking about what it takes. You just know oh, the concert's at eight o'clock. So if I ask you to come over at 12, then you got time. But you don't mm -hmm. have time because my day started at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. Or could have started at 6 a.m. Um, it's additionally challenging to be an African-American female. Absolutely. Um I don't see other unicorns much. Mm -hmm. That's what we call each other. We kind of you, you are. You, see it, <laughs> you, you see are a unicorn. Female, you're like, whoa, what does she do? What is she doing? And you're like, oh, she's not on the technical crew. Okay, I'm still by myself. That's okay. All right, cool. It's fine. I mean, but I've been fortunate. I've only had a handful of less than pleasant experiences with my counterparts or either um people that report to me if I was running the show as the production manager. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in situations where I'm the monitor engineer at a jazz festival and, you know, I walk up with my bag and they're like, oh, you know, we heard a girl was coming. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, when she gets here, you let me know. My name is Danielle. Cause you got to set the tone for the day. And I can't walk mm -hmm. around yep. with the chip that's on my so shoulder, true. That's but so I need true. to be aware of who I'm dealing with. Um, so that's, that's, if I had to say anything, learning the technical stuff, I don't want to say it's the easy part, but it's managing personalities, keeping your cool under stress. Um, you know, in your head, something could be happening and people are coming to you like, well, what, why does it sound like that? What's going on? And half of the time, I'm gonna let a little secret out. We don't really know yet. Like, it's mm -hmm. like, we're not sure. Mm -hmm. But you have to be like, oh, give me a second, you know, just just one, one second. And you're running through this myriad of troubleshooting questions that are just flying through your head. But a lot of it is based on experience, because mm -hmm. if you if you experience something once or twice and you happen to get burned, it won't happen again. Or when mm -hmm. it does happen, you immediately know how to address it. So that's just a few of the challenges. Um, okay. But for the most part, I've been I. I have to admit that I'm blessed that I've been surrounded by people like the pe the guys on this panel that you know you ever have a question or even if you don't have a question you know it's kind of like hey try this or that sort of thing everybody's working together to to make the show work and to make you better at the same time it's kind of like seamless and it's kind of hidden but you really realize it's happening mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to explain but it's you feel it like you kind of feel the love without it being overt and okay. you know it's not it's not like that all the time it's not like that everywhere yeah i'm i'm so glad you spoke to that and 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 for everyone uh who is listening watching and within earshot she is a unicorn and she is absolutely right about yep. women in the industry Brilliant. there are so few um with whom i've worked and and i too have traveled all over the world there are so few so few so thank you thank you thank you thank you for following your passion um but again I would like for you all 
and I know I'm not sure. Do you remember the question? The challenge is both personal and professional, and how <laughs> as it relates to family and 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 balancing family and touring. Um, would you all continue with that and your your explanation as well, Paul? Would you chime in? Yes, um, wife and I've been married. Uh, let's see if I get it wrong. Seventeen years. <laughs> what? Somewhere around there, and. <laughs> She knew what she was getting into. Um, she was a, a digital media major in college and ran a, a festival her senior year. Um, she actually brought it back from the dead. The year she it was, it was a student run festival in Illinois and um, the year she took it over, it was about to be ended and she uh, got it to last another 14, 15 years. But anyways, from, from day one, we were, you know, a team. Uh, she did production and I did all the, the technical stuff around college and stuff. Um, so she knew what she was getting into, but it still took years and years and years of honing how we act and react in the systems. And um, about, uh, I came off a uh, John Legend tour and she didn't know who I was. I was a complete stranger to her. Mm. And all of a sudden I'm home after being uh, gone for you know, a year and a half straight. Uh, it was back before this stuff. So you're making a phone call, you know, in the mountains of Montana on the bus. And it's like, hang on, hear me, hear me. Oh, oh, oh there you are. Yeah. Or, you know, long days back to back when you're when you're first in that first tour uh, situation where you're doing shows every night or four in a row. And, you know, she gets the, yep, it's cool. It's okay, yep. Mm -hmm. So it took years of creating communication uh, methods between each other. Um, and it took a lot of her being, you know, figuring out the, the hard parts of what tour actually means from being the home person. Um, it can go both ways, you know, if the, if the husband's yeah. at home or the, the male partner. But you then, know, I'm sorry, Paul. You know what? I, I uh, just remember that you uh, specifically have something called the clinic this for way. roadies and families. Would you would you speak to that? Because that's important as well to mention. So it, it fell on Courtney's heart probably. Um, Last July, she started writing her story as a as a Rudy wife, um, and that turned into action. To where we, uh, we mm -hmm. purchased a building in Niles, Michigan, and, and we're going to set up a haven here, a safe place for roadies to come and take time off mm. uh, to get some therapy. Either it's for themselves or with their their significant other, or maybe coworkers uh, that need to come and, and figure things out. Uh, we're in the midst of planning. We've demolitioned the building. <laughs> so it's sitting uh, literally 100 yards from me across the street uh, waiting for its new rebirth. Um, but we've had a lot of uh, exposure. We've had a lot of um, uh, partnerships that have come along with this, much oh, like nice. you know, what we're doing today okay. um, to take a leap. And uh, yeah, we're moving that forward. And hopefully part of the rebuild conversation once uh, we all get to go back to so, entertaining people so this is an existence now that, uh, like, yes it, it exists we have a, yeah we have a, a board and we have okay. a staff of five of us who have been working on various tasks that we think will <laughs> move this forward in this time period okay lots of conversations okay okay oh nice nice thank you for sharing that i i i'm so glad um because it's definitely necessary mm -hmm. um uh artless would you mind speaking toward it and then Dietrich and then Rob, if that's okay, and then Don. Um, uh, there's definitely a lot of challenges personally, especially when it comes to family, when you're traveling so much. Um, of course, there's the not physically being there, um, but then there, there's also an element of you're on the road, you're with a lot of different other people, you're with a lot of different other people who have uh, different energies and you have to absorb all of that because you have to be around them all the time. And it's really difficult sometimes because, you know, when you have to go home, like you have to sort of expel all of that energy. And sometimes inadvertently you don't do it in purpose, but you expel that energy on your bait or your family. And it's not there. It's not for them to take on. Um, so there's always so there's there's a transition period that's that's very difficult that's very difficult because you, you it's almost like you're leading I almost want to say you have to lead two separate lives like you have your road life where you're like a road warrior because it's not an easy thing to do um, to go day in day out do this show 
build the show, do the show, tear the show down, get on a tour bus, not necessarily a hotel, but just a tour bus. You may take a shower in the venue and, you know, and then get on a bus to drive to the next city. Um, you, you, you put your, you, you're, you're almost in this bubble where you're not, you're not really in the outside world, but, um, that takes a, that takes a, an effect. And like, just like Paul was saying, like you could be going through a mountain, you get on the bus, you start moving, you want to call your wife, uh, you know, or your children or whoever, and signal goes out. It's like, you just get into a conversation to sort of decompress. Like everyone, you know, who has a job, they, you know, they get off, they go to a bar, decompress or whatever you do to decompress. You know, we, you have to do that like every day, every day, every day. Or sometimes you don't get a chance to do that because you're in, you're with, you not only are you working with these people, but you're in the bus with these people, you know, and not to say you like or dislike them, but it's just to be around someone. There, there's, there's, it's hard, it's harder to get like your own private time to sort of deal with things. So, so right. um, that's, know, that's definitely a big challenge. Um, uh, professionally, just being a, a, a black engineer, um, you, you always go into the situation, um, you have to go in with your eyes open and because there's, there's been a lot of times where, you know, you are treated as uh, less than like you, you like mm. pe- like mm. usually uh, system techs will treat you as if you have to prove yourself to them when mm. it, the opposite is it's like, I'm, you're here to actually make me comfortable, make me, you know, help me, help me to do the show that I came mm-hmm. here to do. Um, yes. I am a guest in your house. Uh, but um, I feel like it's it's important that we work together to do the show smoothly and completely. And that's not always the case. Like, you'll, you don't always run into the people who want to help. You know, right. people look at you because, you know, you're because I'm a black man. You know, I automatically don't know what I'm doing or I just got the job just because or, you know what I mean? So right. uh, it's it's just dealing with those challenges. And again, like it's just dealing with other people's energies like it, it could be a lot so yeah. and, it, and it could be taxing on you and your family so it's just a matter of trying to deal and cope with with that and and and, it, and it's definitely challenging on our and our on our other half on our better halves um, but they hold us down they do and i think it's necessary to if i might add to have that conversation uh, you know we all we've all had to have that conversation with loved ones you mm-hmm. know because it's I think it's it's difficult for someone who's not used to living the life we live to understand what living on the road is like and living out of a bus or living especially when you don't you don't necessarily see a hotel for three or four maybe five days at that you know uh, I remember being on a tour bus and and for anyone who is unfamiliar there are, I think the maximum is 12 people on the tour bus yeah there's 12 we, beds it should not be 12 people but sometimes right. well let me tell you let me tell 16 you 16 in europe <laughs> i was about to say because there were 15 on there were 15 and we were in europe we were 15 on our bus and there were tra- uh we were traveling there were two groups um that were traveling i was on the one bus where there were 15 of us and then the other bus that also had 15 people broke down and we were in some sort of mountainside there was nothing but a stretch of road and and we had to keep going we had they so they came on our bus <laughs> mind you we hadn't showered we hadn't you know and, and you're already tired and when you get to the next place because we've already had time you know trying to wait for repairs and, and lost time on the road when we got to the next city it was time to, to hit so you now you, you you're funky you're agitated you're mm-hmm. hungry because you haven't had a good meal exactly I'm, i mean i tell you i, I could only eat so many crackers and, and <laughs> I ran out of cans of tuna fish <laughs> you start you know hiding stuff in your bunk that you know yep and everybody because i used to carry shoe boxes my bunk they would tell you would be lined with shoe boxes and i would have food you know cans <laughs> of tuna fish <laughs> I, I would i'd have crackers too wow. you know okay yes I'd have packets of oatmeal because you don't know when you're going to eat. You don't know where you're going. So dealing with that and then dealing with different personalities and then ha- then calling home and wanting to just hear somebody say, I miss you so much and have them say, well, how come you didn't call me? I've been mm-hmm. waiting to hear from you. And you're like, okay, <laughs> okay. So it's important to, to, to make sure that you have those conversations and that you have an understanding and that your loved one knows that look, the reason that I have not talked to you is not because I do not want to talk to you. It's because I've not been able to talk to you and you right. do matter and you are important to me and I do love you. It, 
I just haven't right. been able, but with all of that being said, I'm sorry. Rob, would you mind picking that? <laughs> <up? laughs> uh, sure. Well, I mean, I guess uh, piggybacking on, there's also a lack of privacy. And I think we yeah. talk about poor family because when you're on that bus, you're a family. You you have no private space. There's no personal space. Like you know, you're, you're 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 in bunk beds. You know, and um, and there's a living room, but but you like there, you can't. There's no such thing as a private conversation. And and often when the bus stops, it's because you're at the next show, and and you're it, like they're, they're, it just keeps moving. Uh, and so I think that is one of the struggles to to, to find. Um, alone time mm -hmm. you know or just mm -hmm. sort of private time you know and even if it's to take a nap read a book call a loved one uh you know they, they those times often don't exist because buses no. break down and when you show up you're late and mm -hmm. and already or you know you know we we advance as best we can but there will always be surprises and then it's like okay well how are we going to solve this problem today and there are all there are solutions but we got to find them and and so yeah i feel like when when you know, when on the road, like that's that's where the energy is, where the focus is, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know, we 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 miss loved ones, and it's and it's hard, um, but you know, we 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 find the time where we can, and sometimes like it's right before doors, like oh, okay, we're, we're finally ready. Okay, exactly. they're gonna open the doors. Yeah. I've got ten yeah. minutes to go to a yep. loading dock and make a phone call, uh, and even then, there's four other people making making the same phone call to their loved one, so it's still not yep. that private because right. the time we got um the dressing rooms are full of people the buses are full of people. there's just kind of people everywhere um you know what i'm sorry rob because we're I'm, I'm looking at the time and we're moving along and i'm interested in the stories that you guys are sharing and so is everyone else but of course the clock is telling me otherwise and <laughs> the, the time is not as interested as i yes yes <laughs> so if i might interject and move forward and have beatrix speak to that as well because i'd like for you all to just sh be able to share before moving on to this uh next set of questions uh for myself i i can speak to a situation where like i found out what i was having my first child i found out what that was from an ipad on the back of a tour bus pulling into atlanta that's how i found out like my wife and her sister were there and she literally just held the phone up to the thing. The lady wrote it across the thing. My wife didn't want to know. So the lady wrote it across the thing and I'm having to just be like on the back of a bus like, mm. okay. Mm. But these, you know, these are the things, but that's just a part of the, the life of, of touring and, you know, things like that and trying to figure I was away literally the whole time my wife was pregnant with my child. The, the tour started when we found out and it ended two months after he was already born. Oh, wow. I came home for him to be born, stayed with him for four days, got right back on the bus, on a plane, and flew back halfway across the world. We were in Europe at that point. Well, that so my wife so and I have a brand new baby. <laughs> my wife has a brand new baby, my first child, our child, our first child together. And I have to get back on a plane and go for two more months to finish the tour. Oh, my. Okay, see, that's wow. painful. That is painful. That Come is home painful. to a brand new kid who I don't know at all, who has now picked up two months worth of treats that I'm just like, Hey, I'm here, the guy who's been gone the whole time. And how do I fit now into this bubble? You know, right. and that's kind of having to figure that out. Like, and, and it being extreme because my wife's going through what she's going through from just having the child right. and the emotions of, you know, going through about to have the child. Absolutely. You know, to, to me and whatever I have, when I'm coming home in the mindset that I have and have to, you know, decompress from, like it, it takes a lot. And it's just a matter of definitely having that person as far as the personal life is concerned, having that person who understands and thank God she is someone who, thank God, still my wife and understands, <laughs> you know, where, yeah, you know, yeah. as best as she can, because again, no one will never understand what it's like to live on the road unless you have literally lived on the road. There is no, that's so true. There is no story you can tell that will that will ever place it in the hands of a person the way living it really does. That's so true. Right. That is so right. true. Dom, if you might, before we move on. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, um, I don't mean to be so. I, I'll, 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 I'll keep it quick and talk about things that uh, um, maybe some other folks didn't touch upon. Um, but um, again, yeah, privacy, um, finding partners that that uh, understand what 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 it is you do and uh, being there for you and and having that communication and making sure that you keep keep that communication on the road is, is key, I think, to a successful relationship. Um, and I've been blessed to, to um, have, a, have a partner, have a wife that uh, I get to work with sometimes as well. Uh, oh, wow, that is a so blessing. 
that's been amazing. Um, as far as uh, challenges of, of you know the job, so to speak, uh, in the position of tour manager, production manager, I mean, you're uh, a therapist, you're a babysitter, uh, you're absorbing you know that energy that Artless was talking about uh, from other people, and uh, your job is to make sure that um, uh, their comfort is uh, taken care of, um, they're taken care of, uh, you know, you have to look out for things uh, when it comes to mental health and wellness. And that's obviously huge, Yeah. Uh, you know, to, to, uh, to maintain everyone's sanity, you have to uh, be the captain and you have to make sure that everybody has what they need um, whether it's nutrition, mm -hmm. um, again, exercise, health and wellness, um, uh, mental a health. Discussion. It's a huge discussion. It, and, uh, absolutely. And one thing that I can at least speak to myself personally is um, uh, I, I spent my, my uh, 10 years on the road from 20 to 30, and I got off the road for my mental health. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, am in recovery myself. Um, uh, I'm now going on, I think this will be eight or nine years sober. Uh, God bless so you. God bless you. The people don't okay. understand the difficulties and how, how difficult it is to manage mental health when you're traveling and, and you're away from, your, you know, everything that is familiar absolutely. to you and everyone that is familiar to you, you know, and you, you have these other experiences that you are, are, go, are living through, working through, trying to navigate on the road. And, and it's, it's, it's not a discussion that, that uh, quite frankly, is held often but it's even i think more difficult for people who've not lived it to understand and and adding that component i mean i think that's a whole nother thing that yeah but i i, I applaud you as we all do um Thank for you. that's that's amazing and that is a blessing <laughs> I would like to to ask a question, um, and given that, given that you've just said that, what would you say would be the 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 best and worst <laughs> and worst tours, and and what made them good and bad, and what did you learn from it? Well, uh, again, kind of going back to uh, being that you're in the role of of the team leader, the captain, um, you're uh, you're having to constantly. Uh, Creative, creatively problem solve situations, uh, mm -hmm. troubleshoot things, whether they're personalities, technical things, um, uh, travel delays, I mean, anything. I, I, I've personally in my career have uh, bailed people out of jail in foreign countries. Wow. Uh, I've had, uh, been a part of bus crashes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, how, do you, how do you manage that? How do you navigate that? <laughs> I mean, you, when you, especially like, okay, so you know that you have a show that has to, to that ha I mean, the show must go on. We all know that. I mean, even if right. you're not in the industry, you know that. So how do you navigate that, uh, navigate having to get one of the musicians out of jail? How, how does that work? What does that look like? Uh, lawyers and... <laughs> <laughs> a whole lot of prayer. A whole, right, a whole lot of prayer. <laughs> figuring, yeah, praying and figuring out, uh, honestly, like, uh, because I've had these experience, I, it, it's really set me up for success now because, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. Like, I've never right, had right? that situation happen. Are you, <laughs> like, what do you, you know, I mean, you know, do you find a replacement musician and how do you No, you can't because you've got exactly. this whole show. Like, so you just do all that you can to get them out of jail. Like, what? Yeah, and you pray? You're, you're, I mean, at the end of the day, you're, uh, my role as a tour manager, production manager, is to, to look after the health and well being of everybody that's on that tour. Oh my goodness. And to make sure that, you know, it's to echo the sentiment of, you know, the, the military, let's just say, uh, the, there's no man left behind. I mean, we're all in this together, right. we're all a big family on the road. And you have to do what you have to do to make sure that, um, you know, that day your energy may be on trying to get that individual out of jail, but that's yeah. just how it is. That's, it's part of the job. Like you, you, um, you do what you have to do basically. Do, yeah. Yeah. You, you, so, you, so, uh, would you, would you say that you also become the therapist for the artist as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you develop uh, a really intimate and personal relationship with, with your crew. 
and and with the artists. Okay. Uh, and well, this is true. <laughs> and and they they trust you. You know they they uh, uh, they trust you. They uh, you're in their personal world, their space, their mm-hmm. headspace, mm-hmm. and uh, you know you have to. Um, Yes, I mean I act as therapist, Absolutely. And, yeah. and sometimes you One know thing you I must say, to lead them in, in a direction that you want you, you need to lead them to 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 get something to done. Get done. Yeah, uh, yeah. I must say too that, um, and I didn't I didn't want to brush over this. Artless, you made the statement that we are all family on the and on the road. You have no idea just how true that statement is until you live it. Like you, I mean, because we're in such a, a tight space and we're working on a schedule and we're all relying and depending on one another, um, you know, we rely so heavily on it and depend so heavily on one another for, for everything. And you are family. I don't know you today, but tomorrow you are my best friend. And then the next day I can't live without you. So, and that's how it is until I come back home to my, the family with, with, with whom I share a bloodline. So, yep, yep. you know, and then you come home and the weird thing about it, I don't know if it's with you, if it's this way for you guys, but with me, um, I come home, I can't wait to get home by the end of the tour. I can't wait to get home. I can't wait to get home. And then I'm home for a week and I can't wait to go. I'm ready to be back <laughs> on the road. I love yep. my family yep. and I love being home, but I can't wait to go. I'm ready yeah. to go. But, but, you know, and it's just a weird thing, you know, because you try to find that balance. But um, Danielle, I'd, I'd like to ask a question of you. And then I'd like to double back to something we, we spoke about um, earlier. Danielle, um, um, is it easy to transition from being like a theater director? into other live performances or, or like like music tours or what have you? Um, for me, it, it, it was. Um, I didn't start off doing production management. Um, I started off be, as an audio engineer. And a lot of times um, I got placed in the monitor situation. I'm definitely not bashing monitor engineers because I think their job is a little harder. Sorry, Artless. A little harder than the front house engineer. Hey, it is the front of house engineer. He has a he or she has a blank canvas, and they get to paint or create the mix or the you know what it's going to sound like. The monitor engineer has to paint by numbers, and the numbers are okay. dictated by the artist. So you don't have the same level of creates. You can be creative, but you're basically being told what to do, and not all artists okay. are very kind to everybody. Well, um, I, so I got placed. Oh, it's a monitor engineer situation because of the way that I deal with people. They're like, oh, Danielle, okay. you have such a rapport with the artist. You're so this, you're so that. And you're like, but I want to go to front of house. But I accepted the calling <laughs> and that's right, where right, I right. ended up, which was fine. How I got, I was, for me, it was easy to do production management because I am a detail oriented person mm-hmm. and my life is customer service. I don't really, that sounds like cliche-ish and hokey, but no. if people know me, it, it is what it is. Like I treat my family like a customer. I treat my friends like a customer. It's like, what can I do? I can say you do. You do. I can say you yeah, do. I mean, that I've is you. That is Carol, you. several. Yes, so you I do. I work, and you, when I approach things, it's kind of like, I know if I work hard enough and I know my stuff, I'm good. I'm going to be good most of the time. So how would you say if you have experience planning like small corporate events, how how would you become a production manager? What I would say is um, study, study under, follow somebody or pay attention um, to what they're doing. If that's something, an area of interest to you, pay attention Mm -hmm. to what they're doing and also recognize your skill set, meaning your strengths and weaknesses and work on them both, if at all possible. Okay. to have organization you have to have a good report you have to be able you have to be a people person to the extent you have to be able to manage like Don said and everybody else a lot of personalities and you can't let your personal feelings like in my head the conversation is probably not something anybody else should hear mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> but, yeah. hello listen you're not alone you. you're not alone I, it's like you know okay i understand your concerns and you're always you're like a, putting out fires constantly if you're good at that and that's something that you enjoy i enjoy problem solving and making sure everybody is okay so therefore mm-hmm. i kind of migrated to managing shows that sort of thing so 
I don't have to know everything Robert knows about lighting. Okay. okay. But I need to know a little mm -hmm. bit because sometimes people kind of say, oh, I can't do that. And you're like, well, yes, you can. All you got to do is do X, Y, Z. You need to know enough to be dangerous, mm -hmm. but you also need to put the right people on the bus. How about that? Like, How if about the right that? people are on the bus, then I don't have to worry about Robert. He's got lighting. If he needs something, me as the, the production manager, He'll come to me and say, hey, Danielle, I need this or I got a problem, that sort of thing. Hiding problems does not solve anything from anybody. It, sure, it creates more problems, exactly. to be honest with you. It you really don't does. Know, we, you don't know what affects maybe something else. Right. It's not like if you came to me and told me this, I could have done. Right. And everybody it. plays such an integral part that we don't have time for that. Absolutely. No one has time for that. Absolutely. But you know what? I'm no. looking at, at the clock now, and I'm so sorry to cut you short. Are you good? Now, but... Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about, and I was saying that we will go back to talking about working in places of worship, but I believe that we could tie that into um, how live entertainment or how the live entertainment industry moves forward after um, COVID-19. Um, um, for this, though, I would like to ask our digital manager, Ms. Janine Tanil Ayers to join us in this conversation because I believe her input could be very helpful. So everybody, hello and welcome to Ms. Janine Ayers. <laughs> um, so if you guys wouldn't mind speaking toward, and I think this applies to everybody, what you know the live entertainment industry looks like post COVID um, and how, how, uh, how you feel we'll be transitioning you know, into what our new normal will look like post COVID. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Danielle and Paul and, and Janine. I know we were talking about having um, careers in, in places of worship. So we might start there if you don't mind. So are we speaking to what the new normal may be or? Well, actually, yes. How's the worship? How about that? Well, we're speaking about the new, well, I'd like to start with the houses of worship because okay. I wanted to make that that point um, because we touched on it earlier, but mm -hmm. then I'd like to transition into the new normal. Um, houses of worship are their own separate situation. And I know I'm, I don't want to date myself or tell close to my age, but, um, <laughs> Listen, we're all happy to be here. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but before, uh, the, the age of the mega church, I think that mm -hmm. if you were just an engineer in a church, you didn't get the respect of the industry. Mm. kind of like church musician you've only played in church right but now you have churches like td jakes and joel olstein who is yes, you know his church is held in a forum where professional sporting events were held so if you're working in those kind of capacity it, it's 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 a valid venue like it's an actual venue like when i migrated to the three thousand seat church that we moved that was built that's a, a venue so your approach as a church engineer don't ever feel ashamed, um, but do your due diligence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to push past it's just church because that's a mentality. That's a whole other separate conversation, but that is a mentality. It's a viable venue. Yes, there is the spiritual aspect of it, but at the end of the day, from a production standpoint, it's another show. I'm not saying you treat it cavalier. That's not my point, but it is another show. You need to know the same information. You need to know the run of show, i.e. the run of service. You need to know all the same things and entities to run it as such. There's always music, they're speaking. So the lighting, the video, all of that plays into it, it, into it in houses of worship. So in this day and age, if you cut your teeth in church and you're part of a mega church, you're doing real production. Mm -hmm. regardless of mm -hmm. the budget or whatever it may not always be the best because churches don't always have the same budget as a you know a show that's done in live entertainment per se mm -hmm. but it's you're doing that you know valuable work and it's a good way to cut your teeth that's I, you know what i appreciate that i really do appreciate that so with regard to where we are now in life and in the world um and what it looks like in the future um, how do your individual jobs, uh, how, how do you see transitioning or how do you, how do you think, you know, the transition will be with regard to your individual jobs? And mm -hmm. I ask that, let me, like, let me give you more. I'm, I'm asking that because I'm having conversations now where I'm, I'm hearing of concerts, um, being held in, uh, where they used to have drive-in, uh, drive-in movie theaters. 
sure, you know, sure. they're, 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 those proposals are on the table. I'm, and, and I think, um, uh, I believe it was you, Danielle, who sent us a, 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 um, the link to a concert that was held in a venue, but there, I, I don't know, were there two people there? Well, you know, you, but you know, yeah. 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 So, you know, how, how do your individual jobs, because there are so many moving parts, how do your individual, how are your jobs? How have they been affected? Number one, let me clear that up. How have your individual jobs been affected and how do you see them uh, or what changes do you foresee as we go forward? If, if I'm going to be very honest, I, I don't really know yet. I, I don't know. Like it's so everything is it, it's touched every aspect of our life, not, not just live industry. I mean, we were the first ones to close and probably will be the last to, to open up. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. as sad as that may sound. But it, it's, it's, it's affected everything. Like, how do you check people? How do people come to a show? Are they going to get their temperature taken? Is it a HEPA law, you know, violation? You may have a, a, a fever for a sinus infection, and I have COVID, right. but we don't know that. Right. Um, how, do, how do you handle concessions? How does the artist's writer change? What are they going to require, you know, as far as sanitation? Or what are they going to, you know, sanitizing the dressing rooms and making sure that the crew has, you know, it's, 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 it's affected everything. And I think we literally are living it because on the calls that I have at my job, you know, the Zoom calls that I've been having, you're literally moving through the best practices and methods and procedures as we're moving towards opening cities. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't think like a pay-per-view situation is, is necessarily the answer. It may be a lot of streaming, but that also puts people out of jobs. Right. And right. You, you're an artist, Carol, like, your energy is different if you sing to an empty venue. It sure is. As opposed, to, basically, you're streaming rehearsal. Like I just did it. Oh, right. It, it was. Right. I just did it. I was like, this is so weird. We don't know. I mean, we really don't know. We've got to figure out a way to keep everybody safe, but bring it back such that the artists and the audience can come together. Because it is basically about human human engagement like we're we're humans we're not meant to be isolated that's not how we're right. built no like even this whole you know i'm so tired of zoom calls it's crazy like it's i want to see y'all like i want to be able to talk to you and, you know Ooh. that Hugs. sort of thing okay i need to feel <laughs> right. your energy i want a hug that's what absolutely. i want i want a hug absolutely. <laughs> absolutely but it's it's what we have right now so it's right. like okay what can we do to make the best of it while the powers that be who are responsible for the vaccines, the scientists, they do their thing, but how do we still bring music to people? Because music has a healing quality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so how do we mm -hmm. still deliver the product, but still stay safe? Mm -hmm. That's that's like, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, to be very honest with you, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, and I appreciate that because that's why we're here. We're talking about, we, we, you know, we're being completely and totally honest with who we are and where we are right now. Janine, I brought you into the conversation as a digital manager, and it was as a result of the conversation you and I had with regard to how you started. And you said you started working with Danielle. How have you seen, um, how has your transition been? What's happening with you? Hi, everybody. Hi, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Take a leap. Um, so I went, uh, Danielle and I went to the same church. Um, I started out in the video ministry at my church and then I did audio with Danielle, a little bit of lighting. So now I'm, I do social media, digital management for the mm -hmm. church. And um, we had to quickly make sure like all of our stuff was up and running because one Sunday we were in church and then the next Sunday we were home. Right. Um, so making sure that we could still get the word out to people um, on live stream, right. um, all entities, our website, our uh, Facebook page, uh, Instagram pages. Mm -hmm. And each week we kind of would just improve again, all these, everybody on this call, you know, some, some people that still incorporates because we still need someone to mix for the stream. Mm -hmm. um, so it's only a few of us in the building. We still need the uh, person to do video. Yeah. I was going to ask fingers. My, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, specifically because my church did, was, was unprepared, was completely and totally unprepared. 
So I, I had to, to watch another church's live stream. What does that entail? What what has to happen in order for the, the, the house of worship to be able to host service with regard to a live stream or, or streaming at all? So yes, um, there were some other churches uh, when you're on a smaller scale church and you're not in a mega church, it is harder because you just have your regular engineers that come in, um, you know, and you sing, you may not have social media already set up for your church at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so that requires you to create a page for your church uh, on social media venues. Um, you need a engine, you do need an engineer because you have to mix specifically okay. for live streaming mixing in the house and mixing for live streaming are two different things oh is that one engineer or two um we still have two we have front of the house and monitors okay oh, um, wow so it is like i mean it is hosting a live show it is it is it is a production it's, yes okay okay so a production okay. uh okay. you know so we still same thing uh like danielle and dominic do we have someone that lists the order of this live show how it's going to run uh who's going to be where uh position on on the stages mm -hmm. and things of that nature um it's a little bit harder because we don't get to do all the time a uh sound check oh well, so, yeah. oh my goodness what are know, they because of COVID. No, i'm just kidding like, wait, <laughs> wait those days oh my goodness I, you know it's so funny because when we would have sound checks we would always say oh here we go with our mini rehearsal but let me tell you how i miss having a good sound check. Okay, I would give anything to have a sound check right now. <laughs> so for those of you who are unfamiliar, we go in and we test, we do line checks, we test the equipment, we run through a few songs and it just feels so good because you get like a, 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 a you know, a mini feeling of the energy that you're going to share for this show that night. And I, I missed it. Okay, so, so Paul, I'm sorry to move on, but Paul and then Robert and then Dietrich, would you all, Tell us very briefly the changes that you've incurred and how you see moving forward. Well, uh, obviously it's kind of the hunker down phase right now. And you know, some of us are fortunate enough to be able to weather longer than others, but mm -hmm. um, even, and then you look at other ways to use your talents and, and um, skills to fill holes or pivot or um, kind of like what uh, Dominic said is we all think on our feet where we're very durable, population of people who can okay. kind of make things happen out of nowhere. I mean, we arrive to an arena that's empty in the morning at four or five or six a.m. or a theater at noon where you got to slam your show in and every night people show up to a show at, you know, eight o'clock doors or six, no matter what, and you got to hit that. So that translates into, I mean, we've all had to fill lean times in different ways or uh, Artless did the pivot to TV. I've done the pivot to TV. Dietrich's done the pivot to TV. So, you, you know, you do what's best for you and your family at, the, at that time. And kind of the motto that Courtney and I had is, um, you know, we do the best of what we have at this moment. And luckily we've been able to, to weather this pretty well. Coming back to specific uh -huh. to monitor engineering is I'm like, how do I check a microphone beforehand uh -huh. and then hand it to a, an artist whose brand weighs uh -huh. on that person in there that night or, cleaning, you know, in-ear molds for um, other band members or just how do I do my job with a tech who's local and I've just flown in, you know, from uh -huh. wherever. So those are kind of the things in my head that are just out there. And again, um, that's a lot to consider. Said, you just kind of reference to those who are in charge and, and be the team player you can be once we get the, get the opportunity again. Thank you, Paul. Rob? Um, yeah, I've, I've sort of started referring to this as a, a forced sabbatical, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the work that I do is very much live and, and it takes a lot of people. And that's why, I mean, I, I love the energy in a room, right? We talk about literally breathing the same air when yes. we all laugh at the same joke together and we all cry at the same moment when we all scream at the same moment, uh, has so much power because we are sharing that same air and in the, in the current moment we live, that's not healthy. And so it, it's the proper thing to, to not have that experience. And so uh, I'm just sort of sitting and, and, and not say waiting, but um, 
using so so if if it was a, uh, a sabbatical on my terms mm -hmm. uh, it would be when the world is still functioning and i would go to museums and i would see theater and i would see other concerts and i would i would soak up as much uh, art and, and music as i can um and that i can't right now so instead i'm looking to nature uh reading mm -hmm. fiction um doing things that like i, I don't often do I picked back up uh, my horn. I started playing saxophone at age seven, oh, nice. uh, and I stopped playing it at twenty. And um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so I, it, we, you know, music has always been a part of my life. You know, um, I too picked up the drums at age ten. Uh, and so, like, like I, I want to make sure that I'm still like ready, you know, right. and yeah. from a rhythm perspective, and like literally, like, like are, are these fingers still working? I think and, that's important and, for all of us. <laughs> so, so if I if I can't play on a lighting desk, uh, I, I've shifted to a saxophone and and literally just playing scales and just keeping time and, and just like just, just keeping sharp with our with our skills. Um, yeah. You know, there's and online training programs. There, there's uh, in the lighting world. You know, there's some new consoles coming out. There's some software that I can learn. Uh, you know, so yeah. there, there's there's ways to be productive. Uh, if not cash producing, uh, how about and that? <laughs> sorry, how about that? no, I said, how about that? No, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right about being productive. I think it's necessary for for all of us, be, and because we're creatives, we need to exercise that energy that we are not expending while being on the road. <laughs> so, you know, some of us that we would have the tendency to unravel because we're used to moving, 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 and now we're being told to sit still. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We all need to tap into those things or, or those other gifts that we have, you know. And I'm yeah, sorry, finding, to it. finding new inspiration. You know, uh, I like that. Yeah, and 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 you know, so so uh, when the lockdown first happened, and it's like you know, and reading some historical things about you know when the Black Plague came and 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 society locked down, and uh, Shakespeare went and wrote some very famous works at that time, mm -hmm. right? And so people mm -hmm. hunker down, and I think artists are also in their own personal studios, or or they're writing music, or uh, mm -hmm. drawing and painting, or you know, We're this is our time to create <laughs> we're all doing these things trust me you don't want to see my artwork though but in any event <laughs> there, we just have a few more questions that i'd really like to have answered dietrich one of the questions was for you specifically uh, um, and i'd like for you to answer that question first and then for um dom uh there was a question that came in so i'll move to you after that and then I'd like for someone to speak quickly about how everyone feels about the drive-in concert concept. Um, but first, Dietrich, if you wouldn't mind answering the question with regard to stage, um, being a stage manager. If you don't mind unmuting yourself for us. <laughs> My bad, yes. No, that's okay. Um, so transitioning to a stage manager, um, I'm, I think I'm in a weird position then I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of other people, just as far as our panel is concerned, I think I'm in a weird position where being a backline tech, being a stage manager, and, and, and all happening at the same exact time, like what, what, again, goes back to the beginning of what I was saying, which was kind of, and even Danielle touched on this, was kind of, you don't have to know everybody's job. But if you know enough about a job that a person can even respect what you're saying because you've executed and seen to be executed that way, those things help. So to me, stage managing in any concept is really just being able to execute and work through those moments uh, that arise. Because it's not when everything is going easy that makes the stage managing job hard. It's about when chaos is breaking loose and you're still able to see everybody and bring everybody down and just keep everybody with us a sense of feeling that we're going to still get the show done. So it does, I don't, to me, I don't think it really matters about your background or where you come from. It's just a mindset to me of how you approach that other you know, thing that you move into. Beyond that, I think it doesn't matter where your background is. It's just a matter of adjusting and now stepping down and, and, and believing in, believing and like, you know, seeing through that that's what you're doing. Like you're, you're, you're a stage manager, cool. If I'm moving a little show that's in a nightclub or if I'm moving a show that's out in the soccer field, either way, those skills have to be what they are. That's so a great just point. Skills. That's a, that, that is definitely a great point. I, I agree with that. You, that's, a, that's, that's a great point. Thank you, Dietrich. Um, mm -hmm. Dom, we had a question for you about um, theatrical stage management. How does it translate to live show tour management? Would you mind speaking to that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what kind of what Dietrich touched upon, uh, the, the transition 
uh, to, wouldn't be a difficult one. Um, but you're you're moving um, people a set. Um, you're moving things uh, all around uh, to different cities uh, all over the world. Uh, Etc. So uh, there are definitely some skill sets that you need to learn about. Um, uh, we we talked about it in the last hour, but uh, uh, scalability. You know, um, not every venue is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, some rooms are larger. Some rooms are smaller. Some rooms have X Y Z. So being able to understand how your show scales uh, is is super important. And um, and then, uh, you know, getting further into the technical things, like um, just just to throw out an example as well, if, if you have a show built or something built in the United States, and all of a sudden you're going over to Europe or yeah. UK, et cetera, uh, uh, electricity is different, you, you know, yeah. you <laughs> you know, different things like that. So there's a myriad, <laughs> I know. myriad that, that you have to, uh, you know, consider and learn and uh, uh, um, take stock of um, mm -hmm. because you're not in the same room every single day. So it is a little bit different. Um, but as far as uh, the making tr the transition, um, going back to, to, to networking uh, and, and just meeting uh, folks on traveling tours, um, you know, keeping in touch with them, uh, mm -hmm. trying to stay connected, uh, mm -hmm. joining groups, joining organizations, uh, getting involved in your local music scene. Um, How about that's that? That's huge. It is. I'm sorry. I would, you know what? I got so excited when you said that because you're, that's so true. <laughs> that is so true. I mean, that's how a lot of my relationships formed. That's where they started, you know, um, more of them than not with our local music scene. And um, you, you start those relationships, you develop those relationships, and then that translates into, hey, are you available for so and so? Are you going to be around for, you know, or you, you in town? Because I just need a quick, you know, that's what that translates into. And, and believe it or not, that has has happened so much with me. Um, I see that we are we are the clock is ticking and I don't like it, but because it is, you know, I uh, would like to let you all know, being those of you who have attended today, on behalf of every single panelist and the Take a Leap Foundation and the pools, that we we are so grateful that you showed up today. We are so so grateful that you joined us. We could talk to you all day about what we do and how we do it and all that good stuff, um, but we know you, we, we, you know, you don't want to be with us all day. But we would. I do encourage you all um, to to stay in touch, to um, continue to look at the Take a Leap Foundation website to to look for more events. And um, if you have additional questions, and I'm sure there were a ton that we did not answer, and for that I apologize. But with those <laughs> questions that you really, really, really want and need the, uh, the answers to, please follow up with Take a Leap. And they, in turn, will let us know so that we can answer those questions for you. Am I right about that, guys? Am I right about that? Yes, okay, see that? Everybody? So uh, we want to make sure that you have the information that you want, because as I said, it's so important to us to let you know that we, we too understand that we're all in this together. We know we're all in this together and we're trying to help each other as you know transition into our new normal. Uh, so with that, I would love everybody to just briefly talk about uh, how you feel about these drive-in concerts that they're proposing. <laughs> I think it, I mean, I'm laughing about it but that just may very well be our reality. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about that. I can give you I can give you a quick, real fast oh. conversation that I heard is that it's it's not realistic. Oh. Just, I'm being very honest. What yes. I've what I've heard is that drive through it's the the money does not make sense. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There's no way for the price of what you pay an artist to come do a show that you can make that make sense with a car pulling up of people that takes up that amount of space. Yeah, that's my that's that's what I've heard and. Which to me also makes sense that it there's makes no sense to me. balance out the two at all. And, and I, I mean, and I mean, it's great that you know I love me personally. I love doing shows outside. Like I think those are the best sounding for me mm -hmm. sounding concerts. Um, but 
it doesn't make sense to listen to a concert, even if you have a large PA inside a car with the windows up. You know what I mean? Like the people are going to want to get out. They're going to want to dance. They're going to sit on top of their cars. Um, yep. And they're I mean, going to start. They're, they're going to have to go to the concession stand and get something because you're going to have to have a concession stand. What, I, what about the restroom? And, what about the restroom? You're going to have to go to the bathroom. Like it's just, it's just, I don't know. That just doesn't seem realistic to me either. But I mean, if it does happen, you know, hey, we'll be there. We'll we'll try to make the best of it. That was my first question when I heard that. I said, so how do we go to the bathroom? It's like, I mean, separate and apart from wanting to dance with the person in the next car, because I'm going to want to get out of my car and dance. How does exactly. that, you know, how does that work? And what does that look like? Um, and I think it's also, it's also, it's like playing to a room that's 30% full, you know, right. and, and, and the economics don't work and the energy doesn't work, right? Like oh. you, you want to hear the person next to you uh, enjoying like that that's it's a communal uh experience it, i agree oh my i agree wholeheartedly that about the 30 percent. i'm telling you i was just doing a live taping trying to stay connected and i was singing to a camera and it felt so weird I, because you i mean psychologically you know the difference this is not tv i'm not doing television right now I, you know so in any event well, Once Carol, sorry, real quickly to, mm -hmm. to your point about, you know, whether it's a drive-in theater and we, we spent a fair amount of time talking about uh, houses of worship. I just want to throw out the idea that like, all the world's a stage uh, and those stages need lighting and audio and True. management. And so, you know, while we talked about uh, um, house of worship, there, there's ballroom work, you know, a lot of corporate, you know, corporate theater uh you know and music you know concert touring uh there's just you know literally every state you know even even into politics you know a political rally of whatever flavor it is is still a stage and a pa and and there's a set i mean there, there's they, there's a look that that person shows up with and so you know when it is safe for all of us to be shoulder to shoulder which i hope is soon um, those things will come back politicians will want to talk to a public musicians will want to perform and people will want to go and experience and and, and be with the community uh and and those jobs will come back mm -hmm. and i can't wait rob i can't wait yep and i, I just want and i just wanted to add to that like you know to all of my audio technicians or and i guess this could apply across the board like if you really want to get into the industry and see how it works uh uh, go to the, the, the people that provide us sound, like go to a sound company and say, hey, I want to know how this works. I want to know, like find out mm -hmm. what who the sound companies are. Um, I think th that's a great place to start um, to even just figure out what you want to do specifically. Like, you know, you want to do music, you know, you want to do audio, but you're mm -hmm. not quite sure what go to a sound company because you can learn so many different facets and not only within the company, but while doing the show for the company, you can see other people and observe other people, what they do. You get to, you sort of get that connection with people who are doing it. You can ask them questions and some people will answer, some people won't, but you, you, you want to get the information that you need. And, and I think that's a great place to start and do it. I did the same with a backline company. I used to work for center staging. Oh yeah. I was all from tour. I went to them. Hey, I'm still a tech. You need techs. All right, cool. How about send me out? And after that, I heard building of the relationships. That's how the relationships keep playing out. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that, that's so true. That you know what? Thank you again to each and every one of you panelists for the information that you shared, for the knowledge you've imparted, for you know, for for just sharing. Period. Because I learned some things today of which I was unaware, and I already respected you, and I know that you're phenomenal. But I, I respect you all on a, on another level. I've worked with you all and still didn't know some of these things. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you uh, again. And for those of you who are still with us, um, be sure to visit the Take a Leap Foundation website for more information and let us know if there are any questions that we did not answer. We've appreciated you sharing your time, energy, and attention. Um, we love you, but God loves you so much more. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you, Carl. You did a great okay, job. Thank oh, thank you. Woo! Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure. Everybody stay safe, stay well. Thank, yes, thank you, everybody. Everybody for, for doing this and taking your time to do this. And Carol, you did a wonderful job. We love to have you moderate. And just thank everybody, the, the panelists and the attendees. Thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate you. Thanks.